welcome to the Sunset Safari, although there's not much sun about. My name is Brent Yersmith, and I have a Brian Joubert and the thumb. And it is a bearded thumb today. It is. A very, what was it? Hiding ticks or fleas and buzzing Home bees. For the fleas and a hive for the buzzing, buzzing bees. bees. There we go. So there, and on the other vehicle we have Jamie. Oh, there's a little stand walkie running through the bush there. We'll just move forward and he's just gone behind. You see it, Brian? Yeah, just through there. Uh, we have Jamie and uh, Jandre out. There it is, underneath the log. Uh, on the other vehicle, and we have uh, Geraldine and Louise in final control. Now, this is the area where Tingana was last seen. Oh, look at that, a little nose through the gap in the wood. So we just decided we'd come have a quick look. We will probably head back to the Inkahumas and their buffalo kill a little later on the safari. So Jamie and I are both looking for Tingana. So far, no tracks coming out, so I'm pretty confident he's still in this area. So I'm going to do a little loop around here. And remember, this is a live safari, and uh, you are seeing the animals at the same time we are. So if we start jumping for excitement, it is, it is not feigned, it is real, and it's happening right now. As well as the fact you are more than welcome to ask us questions about what's happening out here. And you can do that by popping us an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, of course, we don't only look for lions and leopards and things like that. We also have a look for birds and buzzing bees, as Brian said, and all sorts of other creatures that might uh, occur in this African wilderness. We're on, currently on Juma Private Game Reserve, and uh, this is where we all live as well. We live on Juma Private Game Reserve. Oh, and speaking of birds, particularly beautiful bird that decided to fly away, but Brian's still got them there, called green wood hoopoos. Old name was a red-billed wood hoopoo, and they've got a long scimitar bill, which enables them to pry under the bark and take out all sorts of little tasty treats. I'm going to sneak forward a bit, I think, Brian, try to get you a better view. There we go. Oh, he's going into a hole. Oh, there's actually a little bird party around here, but let's have a look at the, the wood hoopoo first. And there we go. Sort of a wonderful iridescent greeny blue, and they get their name from. And a very distinct red bill, which hopefully we'll see shortly. Now, they live in little flocks. Oh, there's another one. Busy little bodies, and they've got to be to kept, be kept well fed in this dry climate. And we're going through a lot, so the insects are a bit scarce, and they're actually hunting mostly for insect larvae. And we can see that wonderful scimitar shaped bill. Hoppity hop, hop, hop. There's incredible claws there. We're, oh, off he goes. Now, oh no, if we go just beyond the line, to the right slightly, and then you, there we go, you can have a look. There's some white crowned helmet shrikes as well, another very pretty bird, another also a bird that lives in flocks. And it's not uncommon to find different bird species in a bird party, as it's called. So, although they all insects, they eat different, different types of insects. So, quite often, They'll disturb insects for the others, so the white crown strikes will catch the sort of flying ones, while the red build, oh, sorry, name has changed, green wood hoopoos. Oh, there goes another bird, but that one's not going to stop. Uh, the green wood hoopoos were looking for the more stationary insects that are living in the wood. Now, let's see if we go very slowly, if we can add another species to our little bird party. I can't really see, I only see the wood hoopoos and the <clears throat> helmet shrikes. There was an emerald spotted wood dove, but it just flew through, wasn't stopping for a chat. Hi Susie. Uh, Susie says she hopes it's another day of cats. Me too. Uh, Susie, we're going to look, look for Tingana 
and if we don't find him now there's always a strong possibility he's going to pop out later uh, maybe around quarantine or galago heading for a drink so keep an eye on that juma dam cab in case that lead pops up there and of course the is on a buffalo kill uh, in arethusa so we will go there a little later And while we scour the western reaches of Juma, let's go see how Jamie's faring in the centre. Good afternoon and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Indeed, my name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Jandre on camera with me. We've recently been nicknamed by one of the children watching us as the Mocking Jays. That was her decision in terms of what we should be called, since Brent and Brian have got the honour of being the killer bees. Right, so Brent is scouring the western region, so are we actually. And what we've done is we've just both decided for the start of the sunset drive, we're going to be looking for Dubana. We're doing a grid. Brent is doing a, a box on one side, I've done a box on the other side in terms of where the roads are. And we're both having a look out for Tingana's tracks. But since we haven't had any luck here, I'm going to start moving on and leave Brent to his search of Tingana. He hasn't popped out here, so I'll be able to tell that to Brent. And therefore, he'll be able to narrow down exactly where he may be. But yes, some really exciting news coming out of the Sunrise Safari, which of course I was not around for. But it turns out that our speculation yesterday about there being an extra set of Nkuhuma cubs, a slightly younger set, has proved to be absolutely true, Ephraim's suspicions correct. There were three more little additions seen this morning. We're going to also go around in that direction. We're not going to go into the sighting at all. We're going to go around in that direction and just see whether or not one of the mothers has moved from the Inkahuma kill, so the buffalo kill on Arethusa, all the way back to where their little ones are at Buffelsuk Dam. And it's a fair distance, actually. It's a good... I would say a good two and a half odd miles that they're going to have to travel backwards and forwards to feed off that kill and feed off the buffalo. There might, there's, might even be a chance of them moving the little ones a bit closer to that buffalo kill. But definitely really good news there. I was just going off the road, by the way, to see if there were tracks there, but there absolutely weren't. I was tricked by a zebra. I'm very glad to hear that the Nkuhumas managed to get some food eventually. And no, Ohio, after yesterday, um, sorry, Romy in Ohio, um, it wasn't the same buffalo. So yesterday, for those of you who missed the sunset safari, we had this extraordinary moment where Dave and myself were following three lionesses. They ran, they actually caught a buffalo. They jumped on the back of a female buffalo and they injured her back right rump but they just weren't able to take her down they just couldn't manage it I'm trying to find a nice spot to show you these kudu while i answer romy's question so romy it definitely isn't the same buffalo first of all it's a different area and second of all it is a male buffalo apparently and it just goes to show that extra advantage of two extra lionesses that they had this morning as opposed to yesterday afternoon really did them an enormous favor in terms of giving them the advantage of numbers. And I don't know whether Brent has chatted a bit about the wind, but there's a very strange weather this afternoon, as is typical of July. And that means that our animal, like the kudu, are feeling that they would rather they would feel more comfortable hidden away behind the trees and the leaves and it's amazing how you actually start to on these live safaris you get to start to know individual kudu and individual herds of kudu that hang out in certain areas they're not territorial but they do have home ranges and the home ranges don't necessarily stay the same throughout their lives but over the passage of one or two months you get very familiar with the different herds in an area. In this particular herd, we've been watching their little ones grow up for the last few months, but they're all very hidden, so I think we'll carry on and see what else we can find, because I don't think, no matter where I put us, that we're going to have a good view of them. So it wasn't the same buffalo, 
The buffalo that we saw the lioness hunting yesterday will be fine. Although she is injured, it is, it's, it's always astounding just how resilient these animals actually are. So she will be absolutely fine. I think that will heal up nicely. She might have a bit of a limp for a while. And of course the ox pickers sitting on it and pecking it won't help. But I don't think it's going to be a, mortally, a mortal wound for her future. And she had a very, very lucky escape. And a big hello to Sherry in Colorado. We know that Brent is making his way at some point back towards that buffalo kill. He can't head there straight off at the start of drive, but he will be going there at some point. And Sherry in Colorado has picked up on the fact that the buffalo that we get in this area, we often see them with skin diseases, with them through mange, through fungus, through, um, what's it called? No, so mange and fungus are sort of the two biggest ones that we're talking about when we see these bald patches on buffalo. Now Sherry's just wondering, in terms of predators eating prey animals, do they ever get that trans... is it transmitted through that kind of contact? And Sherry, it can be, but the, level, the, the animals have a level of resistance. The one thing that will definitely be passed along from prey to predator is diseases like tuberculosis. The most likely all of our buffalo out here, are quite a large percentage of them and a large percentage of our lions, we know that the sticks, at least one of the sticks females, is showing symptoms of minor t tuberculosis. It's a naturally occurring disease and that does get transmitted between the different animals. So yes, when the animals feed off it, they do run the risk of a transmission of a, a skin disease, but they... It, it's not as common as we might think. They definitely have a level of resistance to it. And of course those skin diseases, when they do get particularly bad, they weaken the animal to the extent that they can actually, or well, they often are the first target for predators like lions because they, they go naturally for the weakest link in a herd structure. Although yesterday was absolutely astounding because this female she was probably with those males because she'd already been chased by lions at some point in the not too distant past. And she was just incredibly fortunate that she had the company of those buffalo bulls because in the end, that is what saved her life. I don't think she would have survived that hunt. They caught her, they were on top of her when we saw it all happen in front of us. But I don't think she would have survived if those buffalo bulls hadn't come back to save her. And then they just wouldn't let the lions get in to the female, to the injured female, the particularly one large bull kept charging them and chasing them away. So an extraordinary example of the, the courage of the animals, whether or not it was a deliberate protection of the female or whether it was just that anti-predator behavior, it's up to you to decide, but either way it made for some extraordinary viewing. It really truly did. And it's one of those things that we will get to see throughout our time on the live safaris. I'm going to concentrate on checking for tracks in this area just to check the last road that Tingana might have popped out on. And while I do that, let's head back across to Brent and find out what he's up to. Now, there's a bird we saw on Cheetah Plains. Oh, and off it went a few days ago that I thought I'd catch you all out with. Uh, but I was, I was proved how, what great birders some of our viewers are. And it was a brief view there of a yellow-throated petronia, or yellow-throated yellow sparrow. So I just saw where they lost Tingana this morning after we had it in this block. So I'm just going to tell Jamie exactly where. Jamie, Jamie. Uh, Jamie, I saw where Ephraim's off-road tracks were the last place in Ghana. It's about halfway between Impala Plains and the power line. Um, he was heading east. I didn't see any tracks coming out in Zoe, so it's possible he's still in this block. Here we go. What we're going to do is we're going to loop, loop, loop through here and actually check up towards Sydney's waterhole. 
Now, it's another one of his favorite routes as he cuts through here, and elephants or buffalo could have obliterated his tracks during the day. And it, the weather has been quite strange today. Uh, I walked on my way up to, to, to lunch, and it was bright, shining, a shining sun. I needed sunglasses, it was so bright. Walked into the kitchen, walked out, and this wall of cloud appeared out of nowhere. And uh, there's a few gaps in it at the moment, but it is getting very chilly quite quickly. Fly, I won't move. Oh. <laughs> oh, it didn't fly far at least. But it flew to a worse spot for the light. A little Cape Glossy Starling. You can barely even see the orange eye in this light. There we go. Brian's doing some camera magic. Oh, we're having quite the birding start to the sunset safari. Now, I think that's how we started the sunrise safari, looking for birds, and, and we ended up with cats. So. Maybe we'll just stick to the birds and they'll lead us to the cats. Oh, it's chilly. Now, Justin, who's in New York, is wondering, is Tingana patrolling more uh, because of the arrival of Gajima uh, and even possibly young Sindile? I wouldn't say he's patrolling more than usual. And he is got a very large area to defend. He's basically taken over with some extra uh, the whole of Mvula's territory. So he goes a lot, he goes quite far to the north all the way down to the south. Um, his territory ends probably around the Cheetah Plains camp and then I know he goes even further south than that occasionally into Malamala. But uh, he's got a massive area, probably five or six thousand hectares he's got to try and defend. And that's why we don't see him for long periods at a time, because he's, he's got to keep moving. Now, not only is there Gajima, uh, Cindy Lay doesn't really pose a threat yet, he's too young. But not only is there Gajima, there, a very relaxed yellow-billed hornbill. Now, as I was saying, not only is there Gajima, but there's Shabambalan, there's Anderson, there's... I'm sure some other leopards we don't know about that he's also got to contend with. Look at that. They are funny looking creatures. And give the beak a bit of a clean. And you can actually see how they use their beak. You can see it's very worn and the dark stain, whoop, off he jumps, around, around the, the, the base of the beak. Here's there from feeding. That's where that dark stain comes from and you can see oh, aggressively attacking that ball of elephant dung but you can actually see that he's actually the termites. So the termites are eating the elephant dung and he's just broken up where they've been eating and now picking the individual. There we go. So he breaks it open there. Now that's easy work for a hornbill's beak and having been bitten by a hornbill before I can guarantee you it is quite painful. Very adept at using their beaks. This looks, I think they always look like they're contemplating life. Oh, termites to eat that. Let's let him continue on his hunt for sustenance. So I just want to double check that Tangana hasn't possibly snuck across uh, via Teller Access Road. Just go very slowly. And the nice thing about going slowly uh, on game drivers, you do see quite a lot more. Of course, it's fun to speed. 
to a sighting. But while you're looking, it definitely pays to go slower rather than faster. Hi, Aaron, and as James told you guys on the sunrise, Fari Vula was farming a Sydney's dam with an unknown female. Uh, well, she's not unknown, she's an unrelaxed female that comes in very occasionally into Buffalo's Hook uh, from the Manuleti. And as far as I know, the last word is that they both crossed into the Manuleti. And I think Mvula, it looks like Mvula stole the remnants of a kill from her. So uh, he was just taking advantage of a free meal. Yeah, so all these big animal parts here, Tingana has used in the past, but always good to double check them. And there's multiple parts that cut through this area. Animal highways. Flew into my eye there. Got it. Probably the only insect left alive in the drought manages to find my eyeball. I deal with the flying fiends of Juma. Uh, Jamie's got the animal that is actually the emblem for the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. The emblem of the Sabi Sands is not a tree, but in fact a water buck that is hiding behind it. Now Brent's not the only one that's having trouble with a flying insect. I've got a fly that's driving me absolutely batty. It appears to have sort of attached itself to me in a rather determined way. But anyway, it's moved off now. So no, it hasn't. Go away! It keeps going into my mouth. It's so unpleasant. Ah! It's of course looking for moisture, but I'd prefer it if it didn't find it in my mouth or in the corners of my eyes. Immediately as I drive up to these waters, the air is filled with the scent of them. They've got a very, very particular pungent smell. Oh, cute. <laughs> Are you playing peekaboo over mom? How sweet is that? Just a little set of miniature ears and a miniature bottom that's sticking out. Baby waterbuck, much, much larger than when we first started seeing it in this area. Oh, still looking to suckle. I don't think it's going to have any luck though. I think it, it's age of a couple of months. It will be fully weaned. Staying close behind mum. As I said, particularly because we're downwind of them, we've got the very strong scent of waterbuck washing over us. And it just, it's a very musky, very I'm not quite sure how, we, how I would describe it. It's quite an oily smell that they exude, and that, of course, is because it comes from the oil that coats their fur. And there's a, a, a story that goes, or a rumor that goes, that it actually makes them inedible and that the predators don't like them. They don't like the taste of it because of that smell offends them. Absolute nonsense. There is nothing that would stop a pride of lions taking down a waterbuck if they happened upon some and if they were hungry. There's no evidence to suggest that the smell of waterbuck deters predators in any way. And when you think about what the lions eat, what we've seen them eating, and hyenas and leopards, the quality of their food when it's sort of five days old and it's 40 degrees every single day or 115 odd Fahrenheit every day, it starts to go very slimy and very revolting very quickly. If you've seen lions eat that, you cannot possibly stretch your mind to believe that they would be deterred from munching on a waterbuck just because it is slightly pungent. And it's not a horrible smell at all. It really isn't. It's, um, it's just very animal. It's a very animal smell. <coughs> that was 
it's not very descriptive i'm sorry my my olfactory description is um clearly not up to par this afternoon jandre what would you say a water buck smells like uh, vm is the best at this game vm has decided that a must bull elephant smells like what we call rotten oros well not we don't call it rotten oros we call it oros in south africa go away <laughs> Waterbuck looking at me like I'm completely loopy and it just keeps invading my personal space. I'm trying to find you another view of it. Oh. Uh. <laughs> in my mouth again. <laughs> out on my arm. Ah. Uh, out on my hand. This is really too much, Fly. This really is too much. Go away. <laughs> Where's Steph? Where's Steph when I need him? You'll get rid of it for me. Listen, Fly, there's a whole heap of pungent water bucks not 40 meters away from us. Could you please go there? Jeanre says I should just do us all a favor and swallow and get rid of it completely next time it's in my mouth. I object strongly. <laughs> Nobody likes a fly. Nobody likes an irritating fly. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Andre. Here's a view of the water buck baby. Jerry, of course, is now telling me not to get sick and not to blame her if I do, which is a, is a bit of, is a bit sort of um, cheeky since she brought the disease back into camp with her from leave. But don't worry, Jerry. I won't blame you, and I'm not sick. <coughs> Jandre says you'll blame Jerry. So there we go. The water buck with the very strong animal smell, as I described it. Um, because I really cannot think of any better way of describing it. I need, I need a better description, I suppose. One day old, one day old buffalo carcass, you think? That was Jandre's description. I'm not sure. It doesn't smell sort of rotten meat enough for that. We're just talking about their scent in answer to Mary's question while I attempt to rid myself of this passenger that I have acquired. He's got a, he's very persistent. Just <laughs> talking about them. No, Mary, they don't have oily meat. It's an oil that just goes across their from their from basically almost like the equivalent of a waterbuck's preening gland. Uh, sub sebaceous glands throughout their skin that they secretes the oil and that then flows over their fur and that's what gives them the smell that they have. It's also what waterproofs them but it doesn't extend to the meat itself so their meat is like most venison meats very very lacking in fat content. The only animal out here with very very high fat content is a hippopotamus. Water buck are pure muscle underneath a coat of fuzz. This little one is too sweet. He really is, or she really is. And we started off a couple of months ago seeing these little water buck calves left all on their own away from the mothers. And that is what water buck do when they initially have their babies. They hide them away in vegetation and they just leave them. And that is their approach to parenting, which is not necessarily a bad approach, it's just the approach that some, a lot of the larger antelope species follow. Essentially just leaving them behind so as not to draw attention to them. And they instinctively stay dead still when predators approach. Even to the point that I've occasionally encountered roan and sable babies, and I've been about five meters away from them before I've spotted them on foot. Not here, elsewhere, where there's slightly higher concentration of those antelopes. At this age, if it were a boy, it would probably have horns, so it's most likely a female. Most of the little waterback male calves are starting to grow the tiniest little points of horns on the tops of their heads. Okay, and the waterback, despite being right next to Treehouse Dam, will have to wait another few months before they can live up to the name waterbuck and spend as much time in the water as they usually do. And that of course ties it back into why they're oily in the first place, which is to waterproof their coat. And you know, I'm not sure how it's happened, but somehow the fly has given up. 
It has abandoned its quest to enter either up my nose or into my mouth, and it seems to have gone away. I'm trying to see if it's on Jandre anywhere. Hmm? Oh, Jandre says he, he, he ate it. He didn't, of course, but um, if he did, I'd be quite grateful. It's definitely improved the quality of my concentration, but apparently not my smell description. So Brent just updating everybody. Oh, excuse me. <coughs> Let's try that again. Brent just updating everybody on the Game Drive channel about the fact that he cannot find Tingana, but that he might be going for a little bit of a walk at some point in the block. So we're all obviously very keen to see him, and we are not alone in that regard. We seem to do relatively long stints without spotting Tingana before he returns. I also heard a rumour that Karula might be somewhere in the vicinity, so we're going to be looking for her as well. As always, we're always on the lookout for Karula. <coughs> Here we go. Jerry. <laughs> And as I hack away, James Dungan would like to know which trees of the area would help to boost immune systems in order to aid against fighting infections that Jerry's brought back from her leave cycle. Um, poor Jerry, shame. It's not a very pleasant way to finish off one's holiday. So James, one of the big things would be to try and get hold of, obviously this, this sort of goes without saying, but you know how we always talk about during flu season, make sure you get plenty of vitamin C, have your, have your oranges and your citrus fruits. The same applies here. And marula fruits would be a very good way forward. Unfortunately for us, marula fruit season is not in the middle of winter, which sort of makes sense. And if you were, if you were to go looking for baobab trees, which you do get, not necessarily here, but you do get in a little bit further north, you could go and get some baobab fruit, which also has very, very high contents of, of vitamin C, which, of course, is known to boost immune systems. And then there is a Bushman's fever tree, or fever berry, which is also used to combat, that's more used to combat the symptoms of a cold or a flu. Two little Stenbock racing furiously away. Luckily, our cameramen are some of the best in the world, and they have the speed <laughs> to manage to show you that brief view of two disappearing tan and white bottoms of a Stenbock pair that were obviously foraging here. Now, there's a very traditional belief in terms of medication, in terms of, of plant medication, that all, a whole host of things can be treated through blood purification. And that was something that Herbert was teaching me about on Bushwalk the other day. Herbert, of course, being a fount of wisdom when it comes to such beliefs and such cures and potions and so on. And he told me all about a tree, which is the monkey poddle, one of the senna plants that is used. That what they do is they take the roots and they make a potion out of the roots combined with the magic guari, and they use that as a way of blood purification. And blood purification is believed to be a way of helping to prevent disease as well as to cure some of them. Now there's lots of different things that you could use out here. Unfortunately none of them really are that prevalent on Juma. Now there's no, certainly no marula fruits, there's no baobab for us to go and collect the fruit from. I love baobab fruit, it's one of my favorite fruits out here. I'll just have to make do with the traditional vitamin boosters while I head off and I'm not sick by the way don't worry I'm not ill at all Jerry can relax I'm not going to shout at her <laughs> just coughing so while we continue on and decide where we're going to go from here let's head back to Brent and see how his search for Tingana is going we've done a big loop around this area and we haven't found any tracks yet of of Tingana so I think we're gonna head back towards that last position 
I'm just listening to where Ephraim last had him. Sorry, if uh, what was that message? Oh, very, very interesting. Copy, thanks. So it seems like Mvula actually is mating with that female. And uh, he's been seen on the fence line on the entrance road in the Manuleti mating. Copy, thanks, Ev. Um, I'm going to do Impala Road. I've done Zoe's, no tracks. Um, I'm just going to check where you last went in. Maybe he's Lala on a Shadulu there somewhere. Okay, so there we go. Very interesting. So one of the Cheetah Plains drivers saw Mvula and that female mating next to the fence line. The Franklin running off. Copy, thanks. Okay, so Ephraim was just letting me know exactly where uh, he lost Tingana. So we have been in that area. We've done now a, a first small loop and then a bigger loop. And is, is, I'm pretty confident there haven't been too many Ellies around. They haven't trampled any tracks. There haven't been any big herds of buffalo. So there's a strong possibility that he's having a snooze. And you might have heard me say it. He might be Lala on a Shadulu. That means he might be sleeping on a termite mound. Shadulu is uh, the Shangan name for a termite mound. Ranga says, for the, our new Safari Live viewers, what tracks do we like to point out uh, uh, that we see most often or because they're rare? I think probably Lion and Leopard <laughs> are the ones we probably point out the most because we are quite often looking for them. And then uh, I think we do almost all the tracks. One of my favorite to point out is, a, is an art track because it's very, very distinct and very unusual. Well, this morning we did some honey badger, I mean not honey badger, it was a porcupine track this morning. Um, so it all, it all just depends on the day which tracks uh, we point out. Normally we do a lot more tracks in the, in the early morning uh, and that means there's been no wind during the day so the tracks are much more clear and especially as that sun sort of pops out it throws a shadow making them a little bit easier to see. In this type of light tracks are actually quite difficult to see and especially with the camera. So when we do do tracks, it tends to be on the sunrise safaris, unless we've got a really nice track there that's easy enough to see that we can show you. Okay, so we nearly, we're Ephraim lost, Mr. T. And says, oh, Mvula, you just can't keep that old boy down, the legend. Yes, I think you better be careful because Tingana is not too far. Oh, you silly hornbill. Ooh. Um, okay, Brian, through that gap, oh, he's moved. It was a beautiful little chagra. Oh, he's moved a little bit further on. I'm just gonna... Don't fly when I start, please. Okay, so he has flown into there, that pile of wood there. Oh, oh there he is, right at the base, well done Brian. Here we go, little chagra. Oh, 
Ooh. Now, which chagra is it? I haven't had a chance to have a good look. We get two species of chagra here. Oh, there we go. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, for our birders out there, this is a nice tough one. Because we're only catching glimpses of them. But who can tell me which species of chagra are we looking at here? And if you know the answer, send it through to us in questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So let's see how good your birding is today. Oh, yay! Right now we're just saying we really hope the sun comes out. I just want to bask for a second. Oh, it's so nice. It's so much warmer. Now, hi Lynn. Lynn in Florida is wondering why some birds hop and others walk. Well, a lot of it's to do with uh, what they feed off, Lynn. So a bird like a chagra, he hops around trying to disturb insects and thickets like that. So that's why they hop. And a bird like a, an emerald spotted wood dove that eats a lot of grass seeds doesn't need to hop around and rush around to try and get its meal. So that's the main reason. And of course, there's various different gains and, and hopping and moving uh, between the different birds uh, depending on uh, how and what they feed on. Oh, so nice to have the sun at my back warming me. It was getting quite chilly. I was even thinking about putting on my other jacket not so long ago. So apparently, quite a few of you are wondering how I got bitten by a hornbill. Now, isn't that a story? Well, it's not that exciting. A, a hornbill actually flew into the window and stunned itself, and I was picked it up and tried to revive it. And when it, it woke up, it was so impressed, so it mauled me. And uh, fortunately, it didn't draw blood, but they are capable of. But I was uh, moving it so it didn't fly back into the window again. Now, hornbills can get very aggressive with windows and it actually happens at our house every now and then. If the light hits the window at the right angle, it becomes a mirror and the hornbill sits there and sees competition in the mirror. So it attacks this bird but just won't go away and it's in its space. You know, they, uh, that's quite often why we'll keep our curtains closed during the day, especially in the early morning and that's when that glint seems to really attract the hornbills to bash on at that at the at the window now I just saw a little plant I want to pick up here and it's quite a cool plant especially because it gets dark a bit earlier so we might even get to do a little demonstration later you're gonna have to remind me after dark I have to pluck it. There we go. That should be enough. I'll pop it on the dash so Brian can show it to you. There we go. So that is a wild Franklin. That is wild cotton. Now if we have a look at it. Now it's been used by lots of people over the years to do lots of things. So it's used to stuff pillows, uh, mattresses, and of course what happens is you remove all the fluffy bits. You keep the fluff and there you can see there we go. There's actually a little seed in there. Let me get my knife. And I'm going to just take that seed. Oh, it's a strong seed. Actually, I'm going to do it on something a bit harder so I don't put a hole in the car. And do it on the 
top of my box. Oh, come back. Actually, I think I'm going to go for the crush option rather than the, the cut option. Probably a little bit easier, one would think. There we go. There we go. So we've cut the seed in half now. And you can see, I'm just going to clear some of the fluff out of the way. Can you see on the inside there, Brian? So you see that little white there. Now, the original sort of Dutch settlers here would collect these seeds, crush them up and get that white center out. And it can be used as a gunpowder replacement. So it's highly flammable and very, very fascinating. So a very useful plant for the early settlers in Africa and and of course, also for the native indigenous people. It's got a few medicinal uses, but mostly used as a sort of gunpowder gunpowder replacement when they run out of gunpowder, or for stuffing pillows and mattresses for a bit more comfort. But now, you don't find too much of it around the place, so sometimes uh, it's gonna take about five years to stuff a pillow of <laughs> collecting wild cotton. Okay, so I think we've got some answers in for the bird quiz. Well done to Stuart, Virginia, and Tay. You got it right. It was a brown crowned Changra. Now, I'm going to show you the difference. Is black crowned that way? No, that's a southern brown crowned, black crowned. So you can see that very distinct black head, but also the gray underparts. And if we go forward again, have the black head. It had a little a black head and the black and white is not quite as well the white's more pronounced than the black in the brown crown chagra here we go well done guys we've just arrived in the area where mana was last seen up there, Brian. You see it? There we go. We've got a big bird of prey in the distance. It's a white-backed vulture. It's a thought for a second it might be dropping, but it's not. It's just cruising past. So when they drop, they really drop like a, a stone almost, fold their wings and dive down. So I'm about to go take a little walk, see if I can find Tingana in the, in the bush here. And while we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to uh, on the other side of Juma. Oh, well, Brent goes for a little bit of a walk to see what he can find. We don't need to because something has found us. And I'm just, obviously, some of you are picked up on what is happening there. I'm going to try and see what have we got here. What have we acquired there, Jandre? Hmm. Yeah, quite, I can't focus on it. You, of course you can't. <laughs> Jandre has a bug on his screen, and I'm attempting to find something to pluck it off with without doing any kind of damage to the, to the screen itself. So prepare, everybody, for a slight headache as I go and attempt to pick this up. What are you? I don't want to touch the screen. I think Jandre will kill me. No, it's okay. I can clean it. You can clean it. Jandre says he can clean it. Sorry, everybody, for what must feel very invasive. Oh, uh, uh, oh it's gone. No. Oh, no. Oh. It flew away, whatever it was. It sort of looked like a termite with wings. It was definitely not a termite, but that's roughly what it looked like. Oh, I was going to closely examine it and tell you what it was, but... It has vanished. My apologies. Oh well. At least you can see now without a spot on your screen. Oh, it just goes to show sometimes things come to us. We're not too far away from Buffalo Dam, 
and we're going to do a quick loop of that area. We're not going into the sighting of where the cubs were seen this morning for a very good reason, and that, that is, the biggest one is that they are too young and the mother is not there. So we won't be going there. It is a closed leopard tracks, very fresh leopard tracks. Look, everybody look, she's here somewhere. I just smelt her. There's a Stiembuki. Look at these beauties. Oh, I say they're very fresh. Who was tracking here this morning? Somebody circled them already. I mean, sorry guys, I'm going to try to pull over so you can see. Can you see that circle there, Jandre? Oh, I'm a bit too close. There we go. Somebody's been tracking Karula. Hmm. But I just smelt leopard territory spray. Well, I suppose the smell does linger for a little bit. But somebody's feet, Brent's feet, those are Brent's tracks wandering around. Did Brent, did Brent do a track segment on Drakensberg Road with leopard tracks? Because this is, this is very interesting. She was striding forward. Okay. And she's gone in to the block around Gwari Pan. Oof, it's a difficult area. Let us go investigate. She, it was, I say Karula, I obviously have no idea whether or not it is Karula. But that being said, chances are in this area, the fact that it's a female's tracks, it is probably her. All right, well that changes the game a little bit. Certainly changes our route. Let's go and see if we can't pick up any sign of her on Gwari Pan Road. <coughs> uh, stations, these in Kunzo form Fuzzy Ingwe on Drakensberg Road between Central and Gwari Pan. Were they called in this morning? from the Nkonzo form of Fali Ingwe on Drakensberg Road, cutting into the block between Central and Gwari Pan. Okay, copy that, thank you. Well, Ephraim says that it's those tracks crossed on Pipeline Road to the east. That must have been she went in like this. And then that's obviously why I had to call in that on the Game Drive channel to, rather than to waste too much time searching, to actually go and investigate. It's a good idea just to get an update in terms of what the guides have found this morning. I just want to go and double, oh yes, her tracks are back on here. Oh, how terribly sad, I got so excited. I thought that Karula was going to be somewhere here. But her tracks have come back onto the road. She obviously just cut the corner. So her track's back on. And now I think I'll be able to find a nice spot for me to show them to you. Oh, there we go. So we have an answer from Crystal. Thank you very much. Um, Brent and I, I think he forgot to mention, he did say that he thought Karula was somewhere around here. But um, Crystal has sent through the update that Brent tracked her backwards and forwards until last she heard she was disappearing off onto Torchwood or her tracks were walking off onto Torchwood. Thank you so much, Crystal. Very much appreciated. Now, we're not going to... It just means we don't spend too much time tracking an animal that has actually left our property. So Torchwood, for those of you who are new, it's a property that lies to the east of our boundary and it is not within our area of traverse so we can't go there and we can't follow her in that direction which means we have to leave it to the others to hopefully find us for her or keep an eye on her movements and let us know whether or not she's on her way back to this area oh, i got so excited i was really hoping that we might have a karula sighting Lots of hyena tracks as well around here, which I'm sure 
they're not fresh fresh but they have been around and about which is again a dangerous thing for our little lion cubs that are hiding in the drainage line over here And there we go, we've actually got a question from James Dungan on that very subject, which is, in terms of, uh, do we have a lack of hyena sightings because they have booked out due to the high concentration of leopard and lion cubs? There is definitely a potential argument in terms of the almost constant presence of the lionesses in this area, the, the Inkuhumas in this area. They've been clearly planning on denning around here for weeks and weeks that we've just been seeing them more often than we usually do on Juma or at least more frequently on Juma. Now James, I think you're right. I think it has to do with the lion population or the, the current area of the, their home range that they are utilizing. I think that might have been why they've moved their den sites further to the west of our traverse area. So that's what I think has happened there. Leopard cubs probably less make less of an impact, but then we've already speculated, and I think we, we're all convinced in our own minds that the reason that Karula hasn't denned in her usual spots close to the lodge itself, or didn't den with this set of cubs, was due to a high concentration of hyenas. So the hyenas are around. I think they're on Simbambili, but we don't know for, with 100% certainty. Jandre tells me that she wasn't around the Galago shortcut den when they went to check this morning. She has not been around. The one new mother hasn't been around there for the last three days, which does make me wonder whether or not she has decided to, to move the cubs somewhere. So we'll check the Mbubu Road den, I think, today. There's still lots of hyena tracks around, so it doesn't necessarily mean that she's gone for good, but she might have decided that her cubs are now old enough and strong enough. Not that they're very old or very strong just yet, but they're definitely more robust than they were two weeks ago. She might have just decided that it's time to move them um, to the rest of the safety of the clan. Not 100% sure. Oh, we're coming up to Buffalzook Dam. And while I keep an eye out for hyena tracks in the den sites, I'm with Chris Rogue as well on this. Chris Rogue is one of our very long-term viewers and she's very much hoping to see one of the hyenas like Madam, the matriarch of the clan, soon. I couldn't agree with you more, Chris. I do feel like it's been a really long time since we have had a proper sighting with them. And that's just, I think, because they have moved their den site. But Chris, I saw lots and lots of little tracks. L not little, little tracks, but sort of half-sized tracks that could easily have belonged to the sub-adults or to the de November, December, tw January twins. Just pulling up to Bovelzug Dam to do a quick check for any tawny figures that are lying up in the shade, perhaps came to have a drink. No tawny figures here, apart from one very large, very brown shape at the back there. Our now almost ever-present hippo that very, very soon is going to have to start thinking about and finding a new place to go and spend its days. Also two Egyptian geese that we regularly see at Bufusuk Dam. And as you can see, the, the mud at the top, well, pretty much now covering most of Bufusuk Dam, Bufusuk Dam is drying up very, very quickly. What date are we? Where are we in Ju July? 10th-ish? Oh, there we go. It's the 11th of July. So it's the 11th of July now. My bet will be that this dam will be completely dry by the end of July, would be my guess. There's actually a catfish as well. There's a catfish sort of flopping about in the left side there. Um, if we go a little bit to the left where there's a go, if we go up a little bit, sorry Jandra, I know you couldn't see it. If we go up, 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 okay, a little bit to the right. 
I saw a catfish moving around there exactly where you are. There it is. There we go. We've got that motion there. Or is that a terrapin? I think it's a catfish. It's quite hard to see in this light. It's very tricky to see in this light. Oh, it's terrapin. That's definitely not a... Or is it? It's a terrapin. No, it's a terrapin. Can't see. Okay. I was going to say I'm quite surprised. I hadn't seen any evidence of catfish back in Buffelswick Dam since they all died off a couple of months ago. And while we watch our sort of clear example in which the drought impacts the the various species of this reserve. Gary in Durban, you want to know how does the drought affect the birds of this area? Well, one thing I will tell you, Jeffrey, is that this year was, for me, I was very surprised by the lack of bird life. And we watch our Cape turtle dove trying to find itself a drink. So all of the migratory species, a lot of the migratory species, didn't actually spend all that much time in this northern Sabi sand. I know that my friend who works probably about 70 odd kilometers away, a straight line, but closer towards the Drakensberg Mountains. They had more rain, therefore they had more bird life. So a lot of the birds like the cuckoos, oh that's awesome, Andre. <laughs> a lot of the birds like the cuckoos and the other species actually moved away to where there was higher insect concentrations as a result of a little bit more rain. Um, the birds are fortunate. They've got wings. They'll be able to be much more resilient. But for things like the sea eaters, the insect eaters, it is going to get more difficult. And I think they're going to struggle to raise chicks as successfully. They might, you know, a lot of the birds have two sets of chicks in a breeding season. And I think a lot of them are going to be limited to, at least, well, to one set of chicks rather this year. Our fish eagle. Still pays the uh, um, a visit every now and again to Bivelzook, I'm uh, sorry, not to Bivelzook Dam, to Arethusa Dam, but that is slowly disappearing as well. It will mean for us just a smaller variety of bird species that we see. They'll be fine, they'll go and find different water sources, but it means that we won't see as many to add to our bird lists. It's baboon tracks, not karula tracks. Let's do a quick loop in the area, just think about that gorilla might have decided to come back. We can but hope that she has decided to move back into this area. Although, that being said, we don't really want her to stay in such close proximity to the lion cubs either. First of all, she is a threat to them. It's a small chance, but there is a chance that she could be a threat. Secondly, when the adults come back, they not going to take kindly to her presence in this area. And speaking of bird life, there's a very angry oriole in here that I'm going to try and find for you. Whew. Try and spot a bright yellow bird in a whole load of dead yellow leaves. Aha! He's at the top left-hand side of the torchwood genre, in that little gap. I'll direct you in, sort of left-hand side. Further to left and up a little bit. There he is. Perfect, thank you. You can hear him, just listen to the sounds he's making. Can you hear that? that The second oriole call, definitely not nearly as pretty as the main whistling sound that they produce. It's a lot harsher. He was calling to another one, but I don't know where the other one is. Stopped responding to it. Might be a little bit of a territorial battle, or it might just be contact calls between a mated pair of orioles. Okay, let's go check that Karula hasn't come back to us. I'm really hoping that she has. 
maybe somewhere in this block. Having just moved away from Buffelzook Dam, bear with me, I'm going to be concentrating quite hard on making sure that Karula's tracks don't come onto this road. And it's quite a tricky road to spot tracks on, so I'm not going to be looking back at you all that frequently. But while I double check, having moved away from our hippo sighting, Rich in Ottawa, welcome to the Sunset Safari. You were wondering whether or not, because we've been seeing this disappearing dam, whether hippos migrate and that you imagine that it would be quite a laboriously slow process if they did. They don't migrate, although they can move and they do have a, a good 4 million hectares worth of 8.5 million acres of unfenced conservation area that they can move about in. That being said, it's a long distance for them to travel and they don't necessarily know where there is other water. So they don't, they're not migratory species in this area. They do move between different water points where there's more water than others, but they don't necessarily know to go look with our hippo, for example. They don't know to go all the south to the Sabi or the Sand River. They've been brought here by the presence of artificial dams. And as a result, now that we go into this drought season without being able to fill the the dam sites themselves they are not going to be able to survive but rich it's not necessarily the loss of the water although that will contribute tremendously hippo are really struggling at the moment to meet official needs and that applies throughout most of the central and southern parts of kruger and their surrounding reserves which is which it's going to be a very, very difficult time for the hippo and we're going to see some incredibly tragic scenes over the next few months as they, because they are bulk grazers, they're not equipped to deal with any other kind of diet and there is just nothing for them to eat. And they, to make that trip that they would need to make, I think I see a lion. To make that trip that they would need to make would put tremendous stress on their bodies. Am I crazy? I might be. Do you see it, Chandre? I don't see it either now. Right. Well, it was a happy thought, but I think I'm completely. I don't even know where I saw it now. Oh no, not another lion log. It's becoming far too much of a pattern. Well, I, I attempt to redeem myself and just double check that this is not in fact a lion and is in fact a log. No, it's a log. Oh, that's embarrassing. I wish I hadn't wish I hadn't realized that before sending you back over to Brent, which is what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you back over to Brent. I'm going to gloss over the fact that that's another lion log and I'm going to send you over so he can find out or no, so he can tell you how his walk went. Well, unfortunately, I didn't find Mr. Tingana while I was walking. I did find a couple of his tracks. I think there's a very good chance he's going to pop out around the Juma Dam camp at some point this evening, and uh, or at the Gallagher, but around camp. So I think it's a good idea to check that area a bit later on the Sunset Safari. We are very slowly making our way towards Huma Pride, who are still on that Buffalo Kill. I'm going to go check around Red dam first and we did have that hippo there this morning and it could be interesting to see the elephants and it seems like the elephants have moved away I mean we're not seeing as many as we were a couple of weeks ago but they do move in cycles so they should be back at some point
Well, a massive Safari Live welcome to Lana. Uh, welcome to the family. Lana is a brand new viewer. She says, this is so amazing. I didn't realize it was on YouTube. Uh, we are, Lana, 365 days of the year, six hours a day from, a, at the moment, 6.30 a.m. Central African time to 9.30 a.m. Central African time. And then again in the evening from, what time? 3 p.m. Central African time uh, to 6 p.m. Central African time. And as Lana, you can see, we're live and interactive. So send us some questions if you're wondering about anything out here. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look like there are any elephants. But we've got some birdies. And I like my birdies. And there's a particularly noisy birdie there called the Blacksmith Lapwing. And they get their name from the fact that when they call, they sound like a blacksmith hammer tinking away. And we can hear some very, very loud hornbills in the background. Now, the blacksmith black lapwing, you will only really find them around water. If you find them away from water, they're probably flying on their way to water. Uh, the other lapwings we get here tend to be more on the open plains. There are a couple of water-based lapwing species. Uh, the blacksmith, the long-toed, and the white-crowned are all very very much water dependent species. As I said, you can hear that. And let's, I'm just going to up in the tree. There's a red billed hornbill. We had a very nice view of a yellow billed hornbill earlier. Do you want me to go back, Brian? Let's just move back a little bit. Making lots of noise. Yeah, red billed hornbill. So that's the second hornbill species we've seen on this sunset safari. Now, Roger's wondering are they related to the toucan? I think the toucan is a type of hornbill, but not a direct relation to our African hornbills. I think they, they've evolved separately. And you're doing a bit of preening, making sure. Looks good for the ladies. And a lot of that calling is... Oh. I heard something there. Hmm. I'm not sure what that was. I always have to keep listening out. There we go. Let's let the, leave the hornbill while he preens away. I'm going to keep meandering through, see what else we can find. And I can hear another bird, but he's right in the direct sunlight, so we're not going to stop him just yet. It's a grey go away bird. You hear him saying, go away, go away, Probably one of the least attractive calls we hear regularly out here in the African bush is that of the grey, grey go away bird. Now, apparently there's a lion a lion or a lioness, Geraldine, on the Juma Dam camp, because they, one has one has a mane, one has hasn't. There we go, a lioness. Hopefully, Jamie's close by. It's very, very possibly uh, the mother of those cubs we saw. So hopefully, jet there, and maybe to see the greeting with the cubs. So we're going to stay. I think Jamie's a bit closer than I'm going to stay on Arethusa. And here we have there's the grey gilly bird going. What? Oh dear. Right here. Problems. Oh, that's fine. Thing. Back off, basically. So you can see eating some leaves. Normally they prefer to eat fruit. Eating fruit, I do apologize. No, it's not eating fruit. What is it eating? Eating new uh, little fresh leaves from a knob thorn tree. And now, normally they prefer 
fit to eat food. There's no food around in the winter, and we're in a drought. <laughs> complaining much about the lack of the quality of food that's around. One, two, no, one, no. I'm having some red my radio. Strange. Yeah, I think I fixed it. Right, so we're gonna keep moving and while we do that, we're gonna actually send you over to the Juma Down Cam so you see that lioness while Jamie is on her way there. Okay. And how exciting is this, everybody? There is a lioness drinking at the Juma Dam Pan, and we are racing there as we speak. Unfortunately, I'm about to go through a black hole, signal-wise. I've just realized where I am. I'm racing. I'm closer than I thought I was. I'm on my way to her, and we are going to lose the signal in the next 10 seconds as we go down into this dip. Let us stay with our lioness. <laughs> towards us and we can almost guarantee that it's one of the incorporated Okay, well, the perfect thing about this situation is we are coming from one side, the lioness is coming to meet us, and we should have visual of her in the next, I would say, the next minute or so. And we can almost guarantee, was what I was saying earlier, that this is one of the mothers of the cubs, and she might be heading straight back there, having filled her belly for now, heading straight back towards the cubs to go and feed them. So we can it'll be really really interesting for us to know which route she takes which direct line I think she's gonna lose us in the drainage line systems but I think that we'll find her again on the other side we should hello Zebada don't worry actually do worry there's a lioness coming but she's probably not going to try and hunt you. Okay, we should be coming around the corner now. We've been zooming south along Gauri Cutline, for those of you familiar with the area. And we should encounter her in the next few moments.
coming out on the dam wall on the side. And as I said, we can almost guarantee that she is going to be coming straight towards the cubs. Now, if we don't, if she goes over the dam wall now, then we'll know that she's going to pop out here. Okay. be here somewhere she's coming oh hello big girl <laughs> surprise there you all go feed your little ones yep definitely a cycling mother with one very full belly and she's going to come past us on her way she's Terribly smelly. <laughs> She's definitely been feeding on a carcass. Here she goes. Oh, Taxon's also got this update as well. I'm just going to call this in. Stations. I've got her here. She's mobile. She's crossed the dam now. She's now mobile northeast. I think going straight back towards the Mufim Pans and Buffalo Dam. Okay. That's affirmative. I'm going to stay with her. Copy. I'm sure she's going to pop out on Gary Cutline shortly. So, which route is our lioness going to take? She always, all of the lionesses follow the same path when they cut this corner. They then either go north up Gary Cutline, which is what I'm hoping she's going to do, so that we've got her on the road for the majority of the sighting, or she's going to cross the Mulwati drainage line. Look at that belly flapping side to side <laughs> oh a slight thorn on the foot and hello to Ryan who is a new viewer watching and learn as our lioness cleans off her foot Let's go catch up with her, and while we do this, we can answer Ryan's question. Our rider Patty is thrilled to have found this live drive, and we're thrilled you found us, Ryan. We're on every day, twice a day, and since you're in Durban, I can quite happily tell you times without fear of mistake. We are on at 6.30 in the morning till 9.30 in the morning, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 6, until, of course, the seasons change a little bit. But that is our regular time slot. Now, uh, you want to know about how many lion prides we have in this area? The answer is, Ryan, we have two main lion prides we see regularly, or we see, I would say we see regularly, but we are, of course, in the Sabi Sands, and this area is one of the highest lion concentrations anywhere in Africa. Let's just stop here. She's seen zebra. She's seen the zebra that we saw earlier. She's not really interested in hunting them. She's just keeping an eye on them. Oh, she's got such a strange walk. Very full-bellied. It's uncomfortable. It's not a limp. Okay, let's carry on. Ryan, we've got the Nkuhuma and the Styx Prides. They are the ones that are regularly in our traverse area. But, that being said, there are always prides coming and going, particularly with the tumultuous moments that we've had over the last few months. And that's because a coalition of male lions called the Birmingham Boys came in and took over about a year ago. And the resultant chaos meant that we saw lion prides that might not usually have been in this area. The Salalas, for example, all the way coming up from Londolozi. Everybody watch heads. Everybody duck. I'm going to get onto the road. We'll find her there. 
I'm just going to stop. The zebra have spotted her and they're galloping off, but I don't want to add to their stress levels. So we're going to let them just move ahead because her instinct is going to be triggered by their running motion. She might even be thinking about a half-hearted hunting attempt, although I doubt it. She's watching intently, but she's still walking. She has been spotted. So I don't think she's going to be bothered there. So Ryan, we've also got the Talala Pride, the Mangani Pride, or the Talala Breakaway Pride, the fantastic Shemungwes, that are some of my favorite lions. Here, the road's just ahead of us. Some of my favorite lions, just because they're the underdogs. And then, of course, the Coalition of Birmingham Boys, which is a group of five young male lions that entered onto the, or was a group of five male lions that entered onto the scene a year ago. It's now four. One of them died of natural causes. Let's just watch this scenario play out. Zebra racing off, a lioness not to top out onto the road. Uh, Bernie, she's just come onto Gary Cut Line now. I'm going to see if she's mo going to continue mobile north or if she's going to go into the drainage line here. Uh, it's one Mufazza. She's on her way back towards the Dam, I think. Here we go. Oh, there's at least two on their way. I know Taxon was on his way. I'm not sure whether Ephraim is on his way as well. But I know that there were at least two vehicles responding. Okay, stay. She's just gone mobile into the uh, into the drainage line here to the east of Gari Cut Line. I'm not going to be able to follow her, I don't think, but I'm sure she's making her way straight towards Buffalzook Dam. Affirmative tax. If you do that, I'll take Central and then Hyena Road. I'll see you back there. Oh dear. Okay. We cannot go in there guys. There's no point to us going in through there. Sorry everybody. I do need to be on the Game Drive channel. Tax is trying to contact me. We can't go in there. We won't have signal. We can't follow her there. Tax, I wasn't mobile this morning. I heard reports that there were around that um, drainage line system to the east of Bufflesook Dam. But I'm not a percent sure. Copy. Um, I think she will come out at some number of hook hook uh, cut line. Okay, guys, while well, we go and catch up with our lioness, we are going to catch up and we follow her to Buffalo's Dam at least. Let us head back across to, De to Brent, find out what we're up to. Very exciting. Maybe we're going to get a chance to see those little cubbies or even the babies. Not sure which mummy it is, but very, very exciting. And just heard a, a story that apparently Karula has left her cubs on the Chitwa Chitwa deck. And I'm uh, well, not sure if it's Karula. It could be Tundi. Maybe Tundi's given birth. So we'll have to wait to hear more on what's happening there. Now, we're on first standby for the lion. So I'm just going very slowly back towards that area. And was it incredible that Tingana was right there, no more than 50 meters from the lion? this morning while they were feeding on that buffalo carcass. Now that's not usual behavior. I've often heard go inspect lion kills and lions make all that they have to sneak up and have a quick look and then sneak off again. Now that's really interesting. Now I'm, I'm fascinated because how far lions might have pulled that buffalo, moved that buffalo. Because 
I was sort of expecting to see vultures and a lot of the trees around here by this time it's been sunny most of the day and I don't see any. Maybe they're down closer to the carcass and we'll find out. Maybe the lions have moved the carcass further into the shade or maybe there's a, another kill that the lions are all feasting upon someone else. Uh, oh, the vultures, sorry, um, are feasting on. Let's check through here. I still don't see any vultures. Where's that little bird? Just heard. Very pretty little bird. Let's see if we can spot it. Sometimes they don't fly too far. Oh, I can hear another bird, but that's way up in the sky flying over us. Now I wonder where Shadow is. I wonder where her cub is. I've got suspicion they're still to the south there of Hoffman. But I think his cross brings the little cub back for another visit. I'd love to see it again after the great excitement when we saw it for the first time on the No Wild Father's Day weekend. Hi Lana, great to have you asking questions. And Lana's wondering what is the drainage like? Uh, the Saffrican term that we use, a Saffrican is a South African. Uh, a drainage line or a donga is basically a little, like a little dry riverbed or dry um, creek bed is probably a better word. Now, I've been dying to try out a new toy for a while and I, I've got it here now. So we're gonna, we're gonna give it a test. Should we, shall we? Yes, I think we shall. So, uh, and especially since we've got a few new viewers around, and just to show you where we are and what's going on, uh, should I put us in the shade, Brian? Will that be better for the, the screen? Okay, let's do that now. I'm just gonna turn, I'm gonna park our vehicle in the shade a little bit. Uh, we, there's not much, not much shade available. Maybe I'll just turn us like that. That use no trees behind us. There we go. Okay. So I actually went and took a screenshot from Google Google Earth, and oh, it's waking up now. So I thought this might be quite a nice. Okay, wake up. There we go. Oh. My radio going funny. No, it hasn't. It's me being funny. And let me just find that um, screen. Oh, I'm being. I, I, I'm, 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 of course, not the most tech savvy person around. Brian's far more tech savvy than me. So, okay, there we go. Just want to move it slightly so we get Arethusa as well. Okay, here we go. We should have it, all our spots. Oh. oh, there we go. I think I'm gonna have to practice this. But there we go. You can see that's a satellite map of um, where we are. And at the moment, um, we are, let's change color. Um, we are sitting right, uh, is parallel road. We are about there, where that spot is. So that's where we are. Now that lioness that you, it has moved all the way like this. And we, there we go, that's what she's done. And Jamie's with her there now. So that's where she's gone with, the cubs are in this drainage system over here. So that's where that lioness is lioness is going and so that's from the buffalo kill to there now the Inkahumas have quite a big territory so 
it's more or less very roughly does oh, this see this bottom corner here has more sticks and they actually go off this map so that's the Inkahuma territory so quite a large territory it does go a little bit further north here as well so and then the sticks pride this thing's supposed to work there we go change color there we go the sticks pride is down here like that and down onto cheetah plains so there's the cheetah plains so this is all sticks pride here down into mala mala and off like that so you can see and the sticks pride actually extends down to the south there so very very interesting so so ryan is actually in in durban was actually asking so this is the sticks oh my handwriting is quite horrific <laughs> and that is the Imkahuma. there we go and so that lioness has probably walked about two k's um and it's very interesting and we, we i'm, I'm going to get a better map i think this one's not as clear so um the lodge the our camp and quarantine is there over there so very very interesting so i'm going to try and get a better map so we can actually have a proper look at how the animal dynamics move around this area but i'm so happy with my new toy let me put it back where i can't lose it in the box i just need to be on the game drive radio for a second uh, to find out where what's going on Uh, FM, last I heard, I'm first standby, you are second standby, Andre's third standby. Silence on the radio. Anyway, uh, we're actually right here. The line kills just down where Brian is pointing the camera. So we're going to head in there shortly. There's, uh, as you saw this morning, those who are watching, it's a very thick area and it's right in the bottom of a drainage line there we go use the word drainage line so it's at the junction of two little rivers so there's only space for two vehicles at a time so normally with lines we would put three vehicles in but um, just there's a lack of space at the moment there now with the cubs that if that line is goes back to the cubs that jamie's following there now um, i think we'll only put a maximum of two one ve maybe one vehicle just depending on the situation because they are quite young and now those young cubs as well we won't view them after dark uh, it'll be a zone sighting and uh, we will we'll try not view them too much when the mom's not there if we find them and mom's not there we generally spend a very short time and then we leave but when mom's there it's okay because she can defend them from hyenas and different things Um, now, Arcadia was wondering why why we do view lion and leopard cubs differently. Now, quite often, uh, it's the same rule. If, uh, if the mom is there, it's a one-vehicle sighting. And there, it's okay to, to, to view them. Now, for mostly because the mother is more, more alert and more sense danger coming first. Now, lions, obviously, being quite a lot bigger than leopards, are... A single hyena doesn't really pose a threat to a lion's cubs if mom's there, but with a leopard it does. So a, a hyena will be sorted out by a single lion, it's a single hyena. And uh, that's the big difference. And we, we try, I mean we, we can't not affect when we're driving around here, but we try to minimize our effects as much as possible. Okay, you can see it's an absolutely gorgeous winter's afternoon. And I'm so happy that large bank of cloud that was making Brian and I shiver earlier has gone, although I see Brian still hasn't lost his big blankie. Uh, and you can see this beautiful, beautiful blue sky. Okay, so we're going to be standing by here waiting for our chance to go into that lion sighting of the Inkahumas on a buffalo kill. While we do that, let's go see how Jamie's faring. Well, Brent waits for his turn at the lion sighting. We're waiting for our lioness to come to us. We are back where we were before, which is at Buffelsug Dam, this time with a slightly different view. 
and a really stunning view at that of a couple of very nervous impalas definitely not comfortable with the whole drinking situation you can see them huddling together nervously constantly alert this is one of the most dangerous parts of their day heading across for a drink puts them right out in the open with very little in the way of escape routes and that and they have to contend with the ever-present risk of crocodiles not that there are any crocodiles in this area that we know of but that definitely doesn't mean that there aren't any and a constant nervous approach to the water's edge hello ladies you best get your drink quickly I'm relatively certain there's a lioness on her way the question is what route is she going to take is she going to come past Buffalo Dam or is she going to go north and we've got a taxon helping us on one side Johan helping us on the other it's just a matter of playing a little bit of a waiting game and checking behind us every now and again to make sure that she doesn't pop out somewhere here in the meantime Impala are busy trying to gather up their courage to go and have a drink And hello to Mary while we sit here and have a look at Buffles Hook Dam. And Mary, I'm turning this way because I think she's going to come through this way. So I just want to keep an eye on where she might pop out. Mary would like to know how we can tell the difference between one lion and another. I'll have to be 100% honest with you, Mary. That, first of all, that was a little bit loud. I can't tell the difference between all of the individual lions. Because we spend as much time as we do with them, you do get to know them to certain individuals very, very well. And you start to look for the distinctive features. The most easily ident or not easily, actually, it's not that easy, especially if you're just looking at them um, while you're sitting next to them from a vehicle. But the, mo the, the most accurate identifying feature of a lion is its whisker spots that run along the side of its face. Each and every lion has has a unique pattern of whisker spots and those will stay the same throughout their lives obviously just getting bigger um, there's also differences with ears with noses but be very careful about identifying a line with it with it using its nose because the amount of black and pink will change throughout its lifetime usually usually getting a bit darker as they get older I think in that brief moment that I saw her face I think that it's the female with the older set of cubs, which is a little bit of a concern because it does mean that she might not pop out here. It might mean that she's denning the older cubs somewhere further to the west of us. But I really honestly don't know. And it's the individuals like the amber-eyed lioness and the mothers of the cubs that we get to know because we've spent a lot of time with them recently, watching them very, very closely. <laughs> have our Impala managed to have a drink yet? No still the slightly panicked approach there's a little bit of a puddle there that they're preferring to drink at rather than coming through to the main body of the dam but there are some intrepid females in the front that have decided that it's worth the risk to have water that's not totally muddied panic 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 shame and that pr this place probably smells like lion absolutely everywhere Chandra hears alarm calls up north. Taking my earpiece out for a moment. I can hear a vehicle up north too. I'll just make sure nothing's being called in on the game drive channel. Oh, that sounds like a vehicle that has a. That certainly sounded like a tree going over. Well, shall we go and investigate? Let us find out what is happening there. That definitely sounded like a vehicle going off-road. Let's go and find out what's happening there. Oh, hold on. The vehicle might actually be coming to us before we go racing off and lose our wonderful view of these Impala.
not going towards us. Just making sure that they check. Okay, they're going to, I can see the vehicle, they're going too fast to be following a lion. So they're not, they, they don't have that image of looking like they're following a lion. Oh, come on Impala, you can do it. Let's wait and see if they manage to get brave enough to approach. While we watch our poor Impala manage to muster the courage to have a proper drink, they are looking so upset with life. And bear in mind, there'll be lions around here, and Karula is somewhere in this vicinity. <laughs> Carolyn, unfortunately, no. This dam is not pumped. The, there isn't the vicinity of the, the facilities installed in order to pump this dam and it is going to go completely dry. The only pumped areas on Juma itself are close to the lodge. The Boyatella Pan and the Galago Pan. Those are the only two places that are pumped. And just bear in mind, the reason behind that, or one of the big reasons behind that, is you've got to weigh up the consequences of pumping a, a dam itself. And that water has to come from somewhere. And Buffalzook Dam would hold an enormous amount of water. That water has to come from underneath the ground. And do we really want to risk using up the resources for the underground water in order to pump all of the dams? It's, it's a finite resource, as water is around the world. The cysticulas are a bit cross. Look at these poor Ibala. This is the most painful experience. Come on, guys. Come on, ladies. There we go. Panic backward. It is a relatively stressful affair watching them approach. Oh, panic, panic. Is there a crocodile? Is that a stick? Did I imagine that movement? Shame. Imagine living your life like that. Every time you go to get a drink from the fridge, you've got to make sure that nothing's going to attack you. Oh, one young male's just too thirsty to resist, and as soon as one goes, the others join in skipping backwards and forwards. Panic! While we wait for this lioness to come out and we wait in painful anticipation for these impala to have a drink, I feel as though that's actually more painful than anything else. Angelique, you wanted to know how far a lioness will stash the cubs away uh, when she goes out hunting. Oh, she could go anywhere up to 10 miles or more away from the cubs in terms of her hunting where she has to go in order to find herself food. So whilst the lionesses tend to be, their movements tend to be a bit more restricted when they have small cubs that they are denning, <coughs> they will, <coughs> excuse me, most definitely be able to cover enormous amounts of ground and they'll leave the cubs for up to 24 hours, potentially even longer at a time. Oh, mass panic, mass panic, nobody knows why we're panicking, but we're panicking. And it doesn't pay to be nonchalant if you're an impala. <coughs> because everything wants to eat you. Time to go. Enough drinking, it is time to go. They're all straining to look backwards. I wonder what they've heard. Or is it just that they're trying to look over the dam wall? Or over the dip of the dam so that they don't get caught by an ambush predator waiting at the top for them to exit. Oh, no, we're still thirsty. Got a split here. Not all of the Impala had enough to drink. And their reflexes have got to be absolutely spot on. If there was a crocodile in there, which there isn't, I would say, it's safe to say, but you never know. If there was a crocodile out there, the speed at which a, a crocodile can launch itself out of the water 
good 10 meters or more per second that a large crocodile is moving at. An impala or a wildebeest or any drinking antelope needs to be very, very quick on its feet in order to escape its intention, attentions. Panic again. Minor panic this time. Hmm. No sign of a lioness. Perhaps I got over eager in my approach to this area. Perhaps she has hidden her cubs a little bit closer to where we left her. And I think what we'll do is we'll go and we'll head back to that area and we'll do another little quick circuit and just check that she hasn't popped out on one of the roads. So while we do that, we'll go in search of lions of our own. Let us find out who is still at that buffalo kill and whether or not it's four females or if it's three. Bam. I can't see anything. Can you see anything, Brian? There's nothing here. I don't know. No, I'm only joking, of course. Um, I'm just going to have to move so the vehicle can get out. But as you can see, there's an Nkuma lioness there. There's another one lying just off to the side of us. I'm just going to reverse out of the way. It's a quite a tricky spot to get in and out of where the, that buffalo kill is. And there's the other mom of the cubs sleeping there. You can actually see the suckle marks on her, on her nipples there. And she has got a nice big full tummy. So I wonder when she's going to start <laughs> moving. towards her cubs. There you go, look at that heavy panting there. You can see the very distinct sort of suckle marks. <laughs> so there's quite a, a, quite a process happening there, uh, trying to avoid driving over lion dung, which is something we, we, we all try to avoid at all times. Especially Especially when you drive near a buffalo afterwards and they will take off. But okay, we're going to try to get down to where the, the kill is now. Now I saw where that line gun was. Now literally you have to, they just snuck right past this Nkuma lioness because she did not move an inch as it came past her. You can see the track here going down. And she is completely indifferent. They're lucky enough that they don't have a, a GoPro ball to watch out for. So I'm going to have to do it in a, a couple of increments. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to sneak past her down to the kill. It looks like there are some lions feeding on the kill. But we've got two lionesses up here. And then, I mean, literally, um, if I leaned out, opened my door and leaned out, I could probably just, you know, grab and pull. But it wouldn't be a good idea. These lionesses are incredibly relaxed. I mean, look at that. You can see all the flies on her. We are literally a foot from the tip of her tail. Adam, I know you... Oh, <laughs> no, I was going to ask her to move, but it doesn't look like she's got any interest in moving. So I'm going to have to try and maneuver even more carefully now without damaging the GoPros. She really, really doesn't want to move. I'm just cleaning herself there, so. Ah, there we go. It's, she's going to move off. Now, that is, she isn't, oh, she could be pregnant, but it's difficult to say at the moment. Looks like she's going to go find a nice spot to lie down. Which does, fortunately, I actually think she's going to go maybe find a spot have an afternoon constitutional behind the termite mound. Worried about privacy. Only lion in the history of lions. Okay. Well, it does make it a little bit easier for us now that we don't have to try to sneak around the side of it. Now, when, if this lioness starts moving, I'm definitely going to try to follow her. Okay. 
and see how much they've eaten. This is a quite, you can see the angle we're coming into this. That's eaten the whole hind quarters. That's amber eyes. They still haven't eaten that much. And all four lionesses are looking very happy and full. Amber eyes less so than the others, but she was really hungry. She has been mating for quite a while. And hold on, getting a grip there. There's still lots of meat left on this buffalo. You can see the stomach has popped open at the back. It was still closed when we left first thing this morning. Five lionesses took down this massive, massive, massive buffalo bull. Now this is a particularly big buffalo bull, even as buffalo bulls go. And when we first arrived, the lionesses, only one or two were feeding. I think they exerted a huge amount of energy in bringing down this old boy. Now, Roger's wondering, at what age do lion cubs start eating meat? For about three months. Okay, I'm going to try to just reposition quickly. Now, you've got to be careful we don't get stuck in here. And just to show you quickly before we move, the other lioness, the fourth lioness is sleeping over there. There she is. Okay, now let's see if we can move her into the spot I want to get to. And Dave and I managed to get up there this morning, so I'm sure we should be able to. And you can see the steep angle we're dealing with here. Now the one trick you've got to be careful about is not ending up on three wheels. Um, because that tends to make life a little difficult when you want to leave. So we managed to get above her, and you can see those amber eyes. Look at that. So we're going to keep quiet and you can actually hear her devouring this buffalo. strong smell permeating through the air of undigested grass. And you can actually see it all there, around there. So that's some of the grass that hasn't made it through all four stomachs of the ruminant. And that still needs to be, would have still been, still, or well, that would have been chewed as cud at a later stage. But unfortunately, I think this boy, well, this boy's cud chewing days are definitely over. So there are a lot of vehicles trying to get in here, so we can't stay too long. But we'll stay as long as possible. Now, 
Brian's wondering why one lioness doesn't stay with the cubs while the others go out to hunt. Well, they're so far away from here, the cubs, that she has to go out hunting. So most, most of the animals out here, well, the, the predators, will leave their cubs hidden while they go hunting. So she wouldn't be able to produce enough milk if she didn't, and then the cubs wouldn't survive. Okay, there's another vehicle coming in now, so we want to get out of here, otherwise we're going to close up the sighting. And we've still got those other lines up at the top. So we'll leave Amber Eyes to her munching on the buffalo. And let's try and not get too stuck on our way through. There we go. One last quick look. And there we go. Let's go out. Now, I want to keep an eye on that. The one mom to see if she decides to start moving at some point. Oh, I picked up a stick. There's mom. Let's see where the other lioness has gone. Where did she go? She walked off the hill around the termite mound. I can't see where she's gone just now. We'll have a look a little later. There we go. There's mom. I'm just going to be on the game drive radio for a second. Stations, we can open this up to three movers. Um, just two were at the carcass. Uh, the other fuzzies are lying up out in the top of the shkova in the open. Thanks very much, Andres. As you can see, I wonder when she's going to start moving back towards her cubs. So Roger and James Richard are wondering uh, if they thought there was a Birmingham boy as well. And uh, there, I didn't know. I thought there might be, but there's not. It's only the, the, the girls. I've got a few more minutes we can spend with Mom. And there are unfortunately about five or six vehicles still waiting to come in here. So we've had such a great view, and we had a great view this morning as well. And we can't be too selfish, we've got to share. Oh, there's another lioness, there she is fine. She's walking away. She might be, I wonder where she's off to. No, she, oh, she's gonna lie down. Maybe she, she's just gonna lie down there. see that heavy breathing from that massive amount of meat that they've consumed. Now on average a lioness will probably eat about eight kilograms so just under 10 pounds of meat uh, in a day. On average but they are able to glut sort of 15 kgs in a sitting 
and when they have a carcass like this they'll eat far more than 8 kgs a day but on average uh, that's how much they need to survive. Hi, Jen B. Jen would like to know why lions and leopards don't use their claws to open a kill. Well, their claws will just get hooked and, and they would, might damage them if they rip. They're sort of more for catching rather than opening. Um, and here you can see she's giving her paws a lick. And of course, I think it's much easier for them to use those modified premolars that basically work like a very sharp pair of pliers to open up thick skin. First station standing by for Lingara. Uh, stop making your way when you get to the turn off. I'll make my way out for you. Okay, so as soon as they get a bit closer, we're going to have to leave. As I said, there's a lot of people trying to get in here this evening while there's still light. Good for all, for all the, the Inkahuma ladies, it's a, a bit of a time of plenty. Now that could change, you heard us mention a Birmingham boy a little earlier. Now if a Birmingham boy were to meander into this area, uh, he would take the lion's share of that kill. He would uh, dominate the females around the kill. Oh, isn't that pretty? I wonder if she's going to start heading towards the cubs soon. Move backwards slightly so it makes some space for the vehicle to sneak past us. Oh, look at that. Isn't she gorgeous? It's just, we just need to make a little bit of space here quickly. You got a shot through there, Brian? There we go. Lovely. There she is. Um, Marisha is saying, what were those birds we could hear in the background? Marisha, I can hear a few different bird species, uh, and I'm not sure which ones exactly uh, you were referring to and oh flat cat so maybe not heading back towards the babies just yet but I did hear some crested Franklin calling I was going to have a snooze well, let's go look at the other lioness. She looked like she was sitting up. Oof, now the sun has left us and in the shade you can actually feel the temperature drop quite heavily. So you can see this is quite a, a spot to get into. Just getting in here it can put you in some quite precarious. I mean, what, what angle do you think we're at now, Brian? 30 degrees. So we're sitting at about 30 degrees like that. There we go, off it now. Now you can take these vehicles to about 45 degrees. Um, it really feels like you're about to fall over even though you're not. Oh, it looks like she's, where was she? She was lying over here. Where did she go? Sneaky lady. Disappearing lioness. 
We've had a few of those over the last while. But um, we're going to have to move out now uh, to make space for Neil. But we have had such a glorious sighting. And we've had lines with Jamie as well. And I'm going to start crashing out of the block. I think I'm going to go start heading towards where Tingana might pop out. So while we do that, let's go back across to Jamie. Apparently you can't hear anything. Right. There we go. Now you can hear us, my. Um, all is well on my side in terms of... Nope, I'm still fine. Okay, we seem to be all good. Um, the lioness... Uh, the lioness hasn't made her way out. It is getting too dark for us to approach her if she has moved back to the cubs anyway. So we've had a brief, wonderful view of her, but we are m most definitely not going to be trying to follow up as it starts to get dark. For new viewers, we do not spotlight, put spotlights or lights on any kind of cub before they reach a certain age. So we'll be leaving her to feed her little ones in peace and we'll have to follow up on the sunrise safari definitely the mother of the older cubs because she hasn't popped out where the younger cubs were denning. They were seen first thing on the sunrise safari this morning with James. And bravo to Brent for managing to get into that lion sighting. I just had overheard a very entertaining conversation between two guides on the radio. Um, we've got two different game drive channels for different areas as we leave our impala. One, um, one is for the west, one is for the, our side of things, and the conversation went something along this. Are you sure you don't want to go to these lions? <laughs> because <laughs> you can just take standby number 16, which was absolutely hilarious. Right, while I go off and search, just in case we do bump into her, let's go back to Brent for a farewell to the lions. Well, it looks like we might not have to say goodbye as this one lioness has got up and she's moved. This has now become a separate sighting. So I'm going to stick with her and she is heading back towards Juma. Now, I can't see suckle marks. Well, if there are, they're, they're quite new. So this could be the mom of those tiny little babies we saw this morning. Now, that could mean there could be three in Kahumas with cubs. Wouldn't that be absolutely spectacular? Now, Michael's wondering, do lions plan to give birth at the same time? Uh, not, not normally, Michael. So what happens in, in this particular case, there's just been a pride takeover, and that has caused a lot of sort of upheaval. And uh, that means to placate the new pride males, uh, all the lionesses would have probably come into estrus at about the same, uh, same or similar time. So that's why we're having the cubs quite close together. Sorry, it's been... The Singada is now uh, mobile east towards uh, Dari Main. I'm going to keep with her in the block. Uh, negative, Doug. Um, the one with the very noticeable suckle marks is still, still there. But we do think there might be three sets of cubs now. I just haven't had a good view of her belly yet. So you guys gotta let Doug know where to go on it. Afirm, uh, he went into Vuyatela. Um, he was uh, quite far in when they lost him this morning. Okay, so we're still with her. So she's going straight back to Juma, so I'm going to stick with her for now. 
Bad Combreton branch. Watch out, Brian. Okay. So she's just over there, but I'm going to try not go through the thick area she is. I'm going to jump ahead of her to the road. And I'm going to have to be on the other game drive channel quickly to let the guys in the north know that she's about to cross. Station's a single one side Tingala is about to cross uh, Triple M uh, just to the west of the Transformer or Impala Plains Junction. Get around the termite mound. Watch your head, Brian. Standing by taxi. One one satin guy that coming from Arethusa onto Weatella, uh, Triple M, just to the west of the tra Transformer and Pilot Plants. There she is, coming out onto the road. So there we go. So she just went through a bit of a thicker area. We decided to take our chances in a slightly more open area where we had the opportunity to. And I'm still trying to have a look at her teats. It could be, it could be signs of suckle marks there. Let's just jump up around in front of it. to see as she goes close to us. It looks like there's possibility, but they're quite small cycle marks, so maybe it is the little ones. Now she's crossed almost exactly where Tingana crossed. Maybe she'll chase him up a tree for us. And that now, Dean is wondering, is there any way to know exactly how long it takes her to digest meat to produce milk? Um, Dina, I'm sure there is a way, but I'm not sure how to work it out, to be honest. So, uh, I'm sure there is a way. I, I'd assume that they probably, the digestive process might be a little bit quicker when they've got cups, um, due to the fact that they, they, they need more protein uh, to produce milk. Now, she's literally going where I was walking after Tingana uh, a little bit earlier today. So we'll stick with her now while we can. Uh, but if I feel she's getting near a den site where there are cubs, um, I'm going to leave her because it is getting dark. But I think she is still quite far away from the cubs at the moment, probably about three or four k's, oh, maybe not that much, but probably about two and a half, three k's from the den area. And, and the nice thing about following lines is you never know what they might drum up. So she might find Tingana and chase him for us. She might steal his kill. Um, she might chase a hyena. So it's definitely worth sticking with her while she's on the move. And this is incredible. We are 15 foot behind a wild African lion on a live African safari and you're joining us from all over the world as we follow her through the African bush. Isn't that just incredible? And remember, if you want to ask any questions about this gorgeous lioness, 
you can do that by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv. Fortunately, so far she's choosing a nice, relatively open area for us to, to follow her. that so just she's just stopped for a quick lick she is heading into a slightly more trying area but hopefully she will find a nice elephant path to stick with her Come on, hopefully she finds us a Tingana. Wouldn't that be nice, Brian? Right, she's going on the right of the termite mound. We're going to go on the left. The drought set he has. The area she's choosing is making our life quite pleasant. Also, it helps that it's not night time. It's always more difficult to drive through these areas in the dark. Uh, it's the first time we're going to have to take a bit of a wide run around here to avoid some bushes and that. big torchwood balanites tree okay so she's going to a bit of a thicker, thicker area now we will try to stay with it as we bounce along through the African bush But now, from one large lioness to some smaller ones. Guys, I've got such an incredible surprise for you. Oh my goodness, I can't wait to show you. She wasn't going to feed them, she was going to fetch them. Absolutely wonderful. Jerry is doing a marvelous job of resisting the squeal. In response, I'm almost resisting it. Look how tiny they are in comparison to her. This is just too wonderful. And we have yours to thank for this phenomenal sighting. And because it's not too dark yet, we've just, just squeezed it in at the right point. Oh, little tiny one in front, slightly larger one in the middle, and one straggler. Don't know where the straggler is. Oh, there we go, there we go. Wait, guys, wait for me. 
Ah, <laughs> oh, it doesn't get better than this, does it, Chandra? I have been looking forward to moments like this for months to watch these perfect little miniature predators following mom all paws and floppy skin and spots oh go 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 guys it's time for you to get off quarantine where's your mummy taking you she's got a special dinner plan for you lot so so cool okay guys we're going to reposition we obviously when it gets dark, we are absolutely leaving them be. Oh wait, hold on, there's one little one that's still... Let's just wait. I wanted to catch up with mom first before I reposition. Don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. Go, little one, go! Go, go, go! How awesome is that? So cool! Jandre, that's the biggest smile I've seen on Jandre's face in a long time. We are some of the most spoiled human beings on the planet. Oh wow. Oh wow, wow, wow. Look at that. It's time for a rest. Okay. We are going to be extra specially careful with the sighting. You can see I'm giving her a huge berth in terms of distance to make sure that she is not frightened and her cubs are not frightened. You can see them gambling playfully in her direction. Whoopsie. Little ones, mom has got such a special surprise for you. You're going to have a bite of buffalo carcass. Shame. Mommy, wait, mommy, wait. Oh, straggler again. Where's the straggler gone? Oh, straggler, straggler. Come, come, come. Mommy, wait, mommy, wait, mommy, wait. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Wait for me. Oh, mommy, we've got such little legs. <laughs> Hard to keep up. Okay, we're, there's a chance we're actually going to bump into Brent relatively soon. He is on his way in this direction. The second lioness is going to meet her, which is fantastic. It means she'll have an escort. We're going to reposition one more time, and then we're going to leave them alone. Because it is dark, and... They are on the move. I don't want to scare them in any way. Back onto the road. This has been incredible. What a wonderful way to finish off a day. Such special little creatures. I can see Brent's lights. He's not far from us at all. We're going to reposition for one last view. I'm going to get a little bit ahead of her. And then we're going to leave our little lion cubs to their nocturnal journey. Let's just speed round here quickly. I don't think you're going to wipe the grin off Chandra and myself's faces for a long time to come. We're going to be bouncing off the walls when we get back to camp tonight. <laughs> Okay, she's gonna pop out. I just wanna go slowly here, so I don't, there she is, run the risk of frightening her, or the cubs. And we're not going to drive right on top of it. We're gonna let her slowly come in front of us. Yay. Okay, our last view for now. I'm going to let them march off. Impala already alarm calling.
They've spotted her. They look so very, very fragile. Tiny. Bouncing across. Oh, oh, standing on each other. Oh, ho, ho. you're so cute. Oh, we need a break, Mommy. We're so tiny and our legs are so short. And she is striding off in the direction of the carcass, watched by a host of impala. But at only a couple of weeks old, these lion cubs are not yet a threat. Wow. Isn't this absolutely incredible? <laughs> There's always that little straggler. Well done, girl. You've done a good job. They worked hard last night to fill their own stomachs and now taking the cubs across to them. Guys, we're going to let them go off into the darkness since it is a losing light. You can see the impala racing across, giving her a clear demonstration that they are bigger and stronger than her. So while we let them disappear off into the night, let's go back over to Brent. Hello. We're still here. We're still with that lioness. She's just taken us into a bit of a thicket. And I think she's going to pop out into the open. Brian, do you still see her? Just in front. Oh, there she is. Oh, and there's a stump. So what's going to happen? We're going to keep following her. If she does meet up with the other lioness, we'll turn all our lights off. There's still enough ambient light for this camera. Um, this camera we can operate without, without our lights on. So it's the light we worry about quite a lot with the little guys. But these guys are obviously the, the bigger cubs. So it'll be very exciting to see the greeting. Now I think that that lioness is taking the cubs to that buffalo carcass. So interesting times ahead and we'll only probably find out that uh, on tomorrow's sunrise safari. But isn't that exciting? She might not meet up with the others. She might actually just uh, go for a drink and then head back towards where her cubs are. Now she can hear the impalas that are alarming at the other lions. I don't think she knows whether it's other lions or, and even another member of her pride uh, from the impala alarm calls. Thorns, Brian. I'm going to just sneak through there. There she is. Keeping us on our toes, she is. This little maze we've got to work our way through of thorn bushes here. There she is. Oh, she's about to walk straight into an impala. I'm just turning all the lights off quickly. The impala hasn't spotted her. There's the impala. She's spotted the impala. Now, you must remember, 
that these are opportunistic animals, even though she's got a belly full of buffalo, if she gets a chance to grab that male impala, she will. Now that impala has probably been distracted by the other lions, so it might not be quite as aware. Now we're not going to move the car right now, we're going to keep very, very still and just watch what unfolds. She's got enough cover. Now the other impala alarming at the other female with the cubs. So this impala is probably listening to those ones and being a bit oblivious. I can't see the impala, we can still see, ah, she's being spotted I think. Yes, <laughs> you can see how her demeanor has changed completely. But if that impala had happened to stumble onto her, she would have taken advantage of it. Um, I just need to be on the gim draw for a second. Jamie, Jamie. Jamie, confirm that that other lioness went uh, off the western edge of quarantine. Uh, copy, I think I'm going to leave them. Taxi, um, if you keep coming, this uh, one Sati is not going to meet up with him on Pimpan. She's heading now onto quarantine. You can see the impala in the background snorting. Okay, so they're not going to meet up. I think she's going to be making her way back towards her cubs. So we can stick with her. FM yours, make your way. So she, I think she might even walk right past final control on her way down to have a drink at the Buyatella Dam pad. Now, final control, ladies. If a lion does walk past, stay in, indoors. Please do not walk outside. This has happened before. So the way she's heading it is she is going to head and walk between the lodge and final control. How firm you are, I think I can see suckle marks uh, on her. So I think she's going to go right past final control and I'm sure the final control ladies are quite excited to have her. You can still hear the impalas all around us snorting at her. It was a very half-hearted attempt at a stalk she had there. Tuck, I think she's going to walk uh, between Yuri, uh, Yuri's house and Voyatella. So I think uh, she's probably uh, 100 meters from Yuri's house at the moment, walking across quarantine. And there she is. I'm going to try to keep parallel to her, get my light in the right spot. Now she's walked with some serious determination. I mean, she hasn't stopped, uh, done the normal lie about lion thing, but it is a nice cool evening. So that's enabling her to walk without overheating, even with that massive belly she's sporting at the moment. back to those tiny cubs you saw. Now Roger's wondering, will they meet up? No, the other lioness has actually gone past behind her. I'm, I'm convinced that that other lioness, those cubs are about three months old, she's going to take them to the kill. So they go, they'll probably be on that buffalo kill. And so she, she won't meet up with that other lioness and the cubs you just saw with Jamie. Uh, she'll probably feed her cubs, spend some time with them. 
and uh, just hang on a second. Okay, there's a person there that she started looking at a little bit too intently. Um, Mfet, Ngala. So I don't normally do this, but she, we don't like it when lions look at people like that. I'm just going to go across to Jamie so I can go tell that person that they're being a bit silly. Oh, definitely not the best time of day to be a wandering about. We are going to let Brent manage that situation. Obviously, we've closed the sighting now. We have left the lioness and her cubs. It's completely closed. There are no vehicles in it. Just for those of you that might be feeling a bit concerned for them, we've left them to go wandering into the night and we will probably find them, and I hope you're all as excited as I am, we will probably find them tomorrow morning on the Buffalo Kill. It doesn't really, the excitement is going to, got a few hours to sort of percolate and build before we rejoin them once again tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari. And I really hope that some of our new viewers were watching those. I know we had quite a few new viewers at the start of the drive. I really hope a few of them stuck around to get to see that special little moment. Oh, well, we head away from the lioness and the cubs. We're heading in the direction of where Tingana's tracks were last seen, just in the hope that we might top off our marvelous Monday with, it is Monday, right? Yes. Our marvelous Monday with the sighting of Tingana once again, just because we like to aim incredibly high out here. The Tingana being the dominant male leopard in the area. Let us go and see if we can't find him. It's bitterly cold. Suddenly the temperature has plummeted and there's a good chance that he's going to be wandering about. Of course, to Gilly in Mulwak Mul blah, 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 blah. Apparently, Gilly, I can't even talk, let alone, let alone describe things. Um, I'm just listening to the game drive comms. Um, the lioness is distracted. I'm going to let Brent tell the story, but all is well on that side, just for those that are concerned. Right, Gilly in Milwaukee. Let's try this once again. I mentioned a baobab is my favorite fruit and you wanted to know what it's it sort of size and taste. So size wise, it is, we'll just pop this down for one moment. Size wise, it is about this big, some bigger, some smaller, but sort of roughly the size of a large baseball with a very, very solid skin. And it has a beautiful a tangy taste, like a tangy citrusy, almost like a combination of guava and grapefruit. There you go, a bit more descriptive than animal smell. And speaking of animals, Brent still has his lioness. Let's go across so he can tell you the story of what happened. Well, there was a bit of excitement for the evening. Uh, all is well, and she is now about to walk past the entrance to final control. And there she is. Maybe she'll have a look Maybe she might go join the ladies. She's looking <laughs> actually into final control at the moment. Uh, they're watching her through the window. So we'll show you quickly. Here we, here we go. Now you can see who's that? Geraldine or Louise through the window watching the lioness there. There we go. Uh, it's Chelsea watching the lioness walk past. She is. It's going to head down towards the Juma Pan. Is that a car making that noise? Mm. Strange. Okay, once well, she's in the thicket, so I'm just going to pop around ahead of her. Now, 
And Lynn's wondering, is this the one that James found this morning with the very tiny cubs? I think so, Lynn. I mean, it's it's very difficult to say unless she goes right there. Oh my goodness. How do these cables get into this state? Radio and spotlight cables should never be near each other. It creates much confusion. So even though she's got that full belly, you can see how she's still alert. I mean, she did have an attempt at the stalk at an impala and attempted at a stalk at a human. That's not a, that's not a sentence we had to say every day, does it, Brian? Can you say it with attempted a human stalk? Yes, yeah, it's very interesting. Now, during the day, she probably would have completely ignored that human. But because it is night time, going into the day is very different. She knows dominant predator. We are the dominant diurnal predator, but she is the dominant nocturnal predator. There we go. You can see there's the Juma Dam Cam. wait to see where she stops to drink and we'll go try and get a good shot of her from the opposite side. How's that, Brian? You happy here? You good? Perfect. Here we go. <clears throat> yeah, she's stopping for a drink. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't that absolutely stunning? You can see a reflection in the water there. Absolutely beautiful. I've got to stop saying absolutely. I've used it that four, uh, I've used it four times. Lovely with that spotlight. Oh, look at that. I hope you guys are getting some fantastic screenshots. I'm going to do the same. Yes. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. Look at that, absolutely stunning. So we do think this is the mother of those very small cubs that you saw with James on the Sunrise Safari. And she's probably gonna head back and feed them. She will probably make her way back towards that buffalo carcass at some point as well. And, but without those small cubs, those cubs are far too young to be around a, a carcass at the moment. Full belly, nice little drink, and carry on. Now, I'm going to try and continue to unravel. If you hear funny noises, it's me just trying to unravel the nest that the spotlight cable has become stuck in. Oh, there we go. Aha. So I think we're going to leave her now, uh, and we're pretty almost certain she's heading back towards those cubs. So I think I'm just going to leave her to carry on. Um, no problem. And uh, I'm going to try to finish untangling. I think I've got it now. Uh, let's go see what else is out there in this nocturnal wildlife. So while we move on and see what else we can find, Jamie's got a gorgeous African sky to show you. We do indeed, goodness, what is wrong with my speech pattern today?
we have a gorgeous view for you. Just take a moment to watch this stunning vista. The unmistakable silhouette of a marula tree. Absolutely beautiful. Gives us a chance to just wind down after a not frenetic but incredibly exciting afternoon. It also gives us a chance to listen to the sounds of the evening in the African bush. Which I'm hoping might include the territorial rasping roar of the male leopard we're looking for. Oh. All is quiet, except for the plaintive calls of Taxon on the Game Drive channel to get the guys to open, <laughs> to warn them all not to have anybody walking outside the lodge because there's lions. He's desperately trying to get hold of them. Right, let us continue on into the night to search for Tingana. So just, that was a really good example, I suppose, of what we always tell you guys, and I'm sure Brent has touched on it, just in terms of never walking in the bush in a big five area, especially where there's lions at night. It's very, very dangerous. I wish Tingana had been on this tree. Would have just completed that view quite spectacularly. Leopards silhouetted against the burning bright orange of the African sunset. What did James describe it as yesterday? It was hilarious. Or inspiringly savage or something similar. It was a very interesting description of a sunset. and a layer cake of light. It was a beautiful description, don't get me wrong. It was just an interesting one. It's one I've never heard before. Shall we stop and have another look at this? Now that we've got an open view. Let us stop and have a look the glorious view that we have in front of us as dust comes flying past me from my wheels. The Drakensberg highlighted in red. Stunning. And the twinkling of the lights of various villages way off in the distance there. and the gentle sound of a cruiser engine starting up somewhere not too far from us. I wouldn't be surprised if it were an engine that had stopped because they've... Mm. Why has that? They're doing a U-turn now. Let's go find out what's happening. Got to investigate. Turn my game drive comms, switch them over a channel. Right, so while we do that, I walk in the rain. That's the um, the name of the the user, uh, the viewer who would like a question answered. I walk in the rain. You're wondering how many sets of cubs we have. The answer is two confirmed from the Inkuhuma Pride. Quite possibly three, but that's unconfirmed for now. So it could, what is there? Oh cool, very cool. It's a white-tailed mongoose. Shuffling about. Yep, a white-tailed mongoose. How awesome is that? Don't go. It's okay. Come back. Which way is he going to go, left or right? He's going to go left. Oh, he's dashing off now. Hey, that's really, really nice. 
one of the largest members of our mongoose family with a very clear white tail. I mean, it's not difficult to see why a white-tailed mongoose is called a white-tailed mongoose. Okay, let's see if I can't. I'm going to have to go a bit further forward. I was hoping I could roll forward without having to switch on. I think he's gone. I think he has dashed off. Yeah. No, he's vanished. Hey, that was really, really cool. That was one of the longer of our white-tailed mongoose sightings. Sorry to... I walk in the rain. We, we suspect there's three sets of cubs, but we know of two for absolute certain and then there's also at least two sets of Styx cubs. Well, what a marvelous day to be out in the African bush. I'm going to go see what is here on this road. Somebody's found something, but while I do that, I'm going to actually say my farewells for now, unless there's something terribly exciting there. And a big thank you to Jandre for his fantastic camera work as always. I know this, I'm sorry, I'm not concentrating right now because I want to go see what's happening here. But while I do that, a big thank you to all of you for joining us on this marvelous live safari experience. And a big thank you to Jerry and to our lovely control. Right, farewell. We will see you all on the Sunrise Safari. Cheers, guys. We'll catch you then. Bye-bye, everybody. Hello. I am back. And look at that gorgeous, gorgeous African sky. Now, I have been reminded, oh, I'm just trying to, oh, that's why I'm attached through my jacket. I've made a mess here about my wild cotton. So I need to find it. It's in my box somewhere with my extra jerseys and blankets and things. And Ryan says I put it in the box. And Ryan is normally right. What have I done with the wild cotton? Does it go into my jersey? No. Maybe it's in my other box. You can't have enough boxes. I really believe that. I've got lots of boxes. I have no idea where it's gone. Oh dear. Sorry, I had a torch in my mouth while I was speaking. Um, let me have another quick look. I seem to have misplaced the cotton. It is here somewhere. I know it is. It must be. I didn't put it in the dashboard. Ah, there it is. Ha! Ah, it got stuck on my jersey. Now, I'm not sure. Brian's going to have to let me know how much time's left because oh, two minutes. There we go. Thank you, Brian. Because I obviously do not have ears. So, can we see it there, Brian? Now, normally. Uh, you would crush it up and whatnot, but now we're going to cheat. So, of course, I am not going to use a flint to spark it because, fortunately, we live in a modern age. So, are we ready? Stand back, Brian. Get ready to jump. Wow! And that was, didn't quite work. No, I'm only joking. So, to, to actually really get it to burn properly, and you can also use it as a fire lighter, you actually have to burn it for a little while um, and you actually have to crush those seeds open and, and dry them for a bit. And so you can just see that even the cotton itself is very flammable when you just, there we go, let's go to the bottom side and watch how it just sparks. You can see the little, almost little mini explosions happening there. It doesn't smell very nice. Let's put it out. There we go. So there we go. That's the wild cotton. Uh, oh, and we apparently have 40 seconds left, so um, it's been wonderful having you on this really amazing sunset safari, and due to the fact we had cubs, always great to see, and very interesting to see that there is possibly three sets of cubs, looking at those, there was definitely another female that looked like she had suckle marks that we left there, so we'll have to find out tomorrow, and that's why we keep doing this every day, it changes constantly, so from Brian, myself, and the rest of the safari live team, it's been amazing and good night.